This is Marysville, Montana. What was once a flourishing mining town is now a desolate image of the Great Wild West. Little do people know that something that could invoke such stereotypical American imagery actually hit a large population of Chinese miners that wanted to change their Chinese reality by using skills and knowledge they learned in the New World to empower their homeland. They call themselves the Chinese Empire Reform Association. Attracted by opportunities of gold and riches, Chinese immigrated into America looking to support their families back home and escape floods, famine, conflicts, and a deteriorating Qing dynasty that was humiliated by unequal treaties and weakened by rebellion. Around 250,000 Chinese immigrated to the U.S. in four decades between 1842 and 1882, despite facing death by prosecution of treason by the Qing government, who considered emigration as disloyalty. Attitudes towards overseas Chinese changed, however, as they began to become economically successful, increasingly considered useful as their efforts supported and enriched their home. Life was not always better for overseas Chinese. Discriminatory policies soon emerged and the dysfunctional Qing court was unable to protect the Chinese in America, let alone oversee internal affairs. Viewed as unwanted competition against white Americans, the Chinese were singled out by boycotts and statutory measures. However, in 1896, one particular boycott met with unprecedented resistance from the local Chinese population of Butte, Montana. A cocktail of the lingering effects of the Panic of 1893, as well as the defeat of Free Silver, sparked a boycott against all Chinese businesses and products. The boycotters employed a variety of arguments against Asians including the threat of cheap labor, capital flight, and cultural and racial inferiority. Many such arguments fell underneath the umbrella of America versus Asia. Such anti-Asian sentiment had already manifested itself in the Chinese Exclusion Act, as well as the massacres at Hell's Canyon of 1887, Rock Springs of 1885, and the Tacoma Riot of 1885. The Butte Sunday Bystander carried an article entitled The Moral Side of the Chinese Boycott that labeled Chinese laundries as pest houses and the laundrymen as leprous, mouth spraying, and diseased. Hum Fei, owner of Hum Fei's Palace Restaurant, contacted the Chinese Six Companies. The Chinese Six Companies were an umbrella organization located in San Francisco who represented the Chinese in America. They decided that they would not intervene with the boycott and strongly advised Hum Fei not to either. Despite their suggestion, he decided to take matters into his own hands. Along with Hum Fei, Deer Yik, Hum Tong, and Hui Pak brought suit against several members of the boycott, accusing the defendants of violating the rights of the Chinese. The Chinese community also filed a petition joining the prosecution in redress of the boycott. Wilbur Fisk Sanders, a statesman and one of the best lawyers in the state, was hired by the Chinese and one of the few willing to defend them in this case. Sanders attempted to prove that a boycott existed and that the Chinese were financially injured as a result. Since the Chinese were foreigners, he stated that they were protected by treaties between the United States and China and claimed that the matter would be made a diplomatic issue. The Butte Chinese went on to win the case, empowering them with the knowledge of the American legal system, as well as the ability to use it to better their own lives. However, the Chinese in the West were not the only ones caught up in political strife. Their compatriots at home also found themselves in turmoil that would be key to the formation of the Chinese Empire Reform Association. Devastated by the First Sino-Japanese War, the Qing Dynasty had long been in decline. Upon learning of the humiliating terms of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, candidates for the civil service examination signed a petition that urged reforms strengthening China, thus preventing further disgrace. The call for reform challenged the long-standing Confucian system which emphasized tradition and hierarchy. The leader of the movement, Kang Yao Wei, challenged the examination system as outdated and appealed to the newly instated Guangxu Emperor regarding its change. Kong was granted a private audience with the emperor, one that lasted five hours, and along with Liang Qichao, another key player in the reforms, advised the emperor to issue a flurry of imperial edicts that imposed reforms that modernized education, economics, military training, and foreign affairs. In order to enact the reforms, the Guangxu emperor appointed six other reform leaders aside from Kang Yao Wei and Liang Qichao. 
to administer the efforts of reform. When the Dowager Empress Cixi heard of the changes that were taking place, she immediately retook control of the throne and put a stop to them by first sentencing the reform leaders to death and putting the Guangxu Emperor on house arrest. The reform movement only lasted about a hundred days. Kang Yao Wei and Liang Qichao were lucky to get away with their heads. That was not the only problem with the reforms as few educated Chinese had direct experience with the Western technologies and systems that reformers had wanted to adopt. Tan Zitong, a leading reformer who had been executed, remarked, In China, during the last several decades, where have we had genuine understanding of foreign culture? When have we had scholars or officials who could discuss them? You have never dreamed of or seen the beauty and perfection of Western legal systems and political institutions. The overseas Chinese, however, were perfectly suited for the situation. They had the experience with the Western industry and legal systems Kang Yao Wei and Liang Qichao needed to bring back to China. Groups such as that in Montana had lived the beauty and perfection of Western legal systems. Realizing this, the two established the Chinese Empire Reform Association, or otherwise known as the Bao Huang Hui, in 1899 in Vancouver, British Columbia. The organization rapidly expanded with branches around the world, all aiming to return power to the rightful ruler, the Guangxu Emperor, from the Dowager Empress who had retaken power in order to halt the reforms modernizing China. Montana had 12 branches of the organization, and both Liang and Kang visited them in 1903 and 1905, respectively. When Liang visited the Butte branch, he noted that, So far we have met with great success in our work of reform, and expect to keep right on meeting with it. The Chinese of Butte are quite enthusiastic in their work. The Montanan branches built upon a pre-existing sense of community pride, nationalism, and empowerment, based on their exceptional use of and experience with the American legal system, winning a key success that emboldened the community. A close analysis of the extant documents of the Chinese Empire Reform Association gives insight to their perspective, leading to the decisions that they made using the American legal system. Every branch of the Bao Huang Hui made a photo montage, each with the Guangxu Emperor at the very top and some with Kang Yao Wei and Liang Qichao flanking the emperor. Underneath were the photos of all the members with the officers on the top rows and the rest of the members underneath them. It is no surprise to see those who led the fight against the boycott, such as Hum Fei and Quan Loi, as leaders of their branch of the organization. The dress code of the members in the photos gives some insight as to whether they identified more with the Chinese or American culture. Certain photos show members dressed in full western suit and combed cropped hair, suggesting their ready acceptance of American customs, whereas others would dress more traditionally. The members associating more with Chinese culture sported a half-shaven head and a long thin braid. This was known as a queue, required by the Qing government as a mark of subservience. The Qing dynasty warned, keep your hair, lose your head, to say that to wear a different hairstyle was punishable by death. It was therefore a sign of loyalty to the imperial government to maintain the queue. The Chinese who associated more with American culture were not necessarily born into it. Some decided to adopt it after moving to America, notably in those whose pictures show them in American dress, but with half a head of hair, and the other half still growing out as if it were shaved before. The photo montage of the Marysville branch of the organization gives further insight into its goals. Specifically, military education and modernization displayed by the Western warships and artillery shown in the top corners of the photo montage. In fact, the Montana branches along with other branches began military drills in hopes of returning the rightful Guangxu Emperor by force if necessary. The Butte branch in particular had a company that could execute the various commands of its officers with almost the same accuracy and precision as a well-drilled company of American soldiers. Each member was given a Spanish Mauser rifle and a uniform made of a white hat with a yellow cord, band and cross arms designating the number of the company, yellow canvas blouse and canvas leggings, together with a cartridge belt and bayonet and scabbard attached to the belt. If the Qing were to adopt Western military practices, China could become stronger and able to protect itself and its overseas citizens. 
Both the Butte and the Helena branches filed Articles of Incorporation with Montana's Secretary of State, thus becoming officially recognized entities. In these documents, some of their other goals as an organization become clear. The purpose and business of this corporation shall be for social intercourse, mutual helpfulness, mental and moral improvement, physical and mental development, promoting the cause of temperance and moral reform, and encouraging general education of the Chinese people in the principles of the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America. It is important to note that the Articles of Incorporation between the Butte and Helena branches are nearly word for word the same. It suggests that there was a great interconnectivity between the two. In the words of Tran Loi, a principal advocate in the Butte branch, We want railroads and modern advantages possessed by other countries. We want a Congress and a Senate, the same as exists in the United States. We want educational institutions for our people. Our reform movement is not a revolutionary one. It is strictly an educational one, having as its object the lifting of the country and its people from the rut into which they were thrown so many years ago. The victory in the Butte boycott case, as well as education in military and other Western ideals, is evidence of the adaptations of the Chinese community. The Chinese Empire Reform Association thrived amongst the Montana Chinese who had these empowering experiences and whose efforts and knowledge were exactly what the reform-minded Chinese wanted but did not have.